All right. Uh, thanks, Kate. Uh, thank you all for being here at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm Michael. If uh, this is your first time being in a class with me, uh, and I'm very, very happy to be a part of this series, very important series for a lot of different reasons. Um, and as many of you know, I was supposed to do my class a number of weeks ago, but it was a, a moment of fire and evacuation. And so as I said to everybody at the SFDC, the, the wise action for me then <laughs> was to evacuate and cancel the class. Um, but I'm very happy that we were able to rearrange things and that I'm here now. Um, if you're used to my Dharma Doors class or uh, any of the other kind of classes I've done, this is going to be a little different. I'm trying to really uh, respect the, the class series and of course I want to bring my, you know, unique uh, kind of approach to this, but I also don't want to make this sort of, um, well, I don't want to say about me, but what I mean is, is that many of you know I'm a little academic in my approach to these things, and so I wanted to avoid some kind of lectury class <laughs> in that way. And so, you know, on that note, you know, again, I'm sort of, uh, many of you know I started as an academic, but sort of transitioned to a more practitioner uh, Dharma teacher in that way. And so because of that transition out of academia, I don't have a, a traditional teacher. My teachers have all been uh, academics and professors, my advisors and things like that. But I don't have a Rinpoche or a Roshi or this or that. I'm not lineaged. But it doesn't mean that I don't hold certain teachers in very high regard or high respect, or even in a certain sense that I don't consider people my teachers, even though I've never met them or studied with them personally. And one of those people that we are fortunate to still have alive here on, on Earth with us is the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, he's somebody who early on in my study I resonated with. Um, a lot of aspects of his teaching, not just the engaged Buddhism that I'm here to talk about tonight, his unique approach to applying Buddhism to modern problems. Um, so I'm not here just to talk about that or the engaged Buddhism, but you know, he's, Thich Nhat Hanh's a teacher that I, has resonated with me from the beginning where I've been like, that's it, that's, that's it, that's the Buddhism. Like that's, that's my Buddhism. Um, and as I've become a much more sort of teacher in my own right, um, I still kind of refer to Thich Nhat Hanh's writings for inspiration, wisdom, all kinds of things. And so what I thought would be a great way to add something to the Wise Action series um, was to share with you, if you weren't familiar with it already, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's uh, kind of 14 mindfulness practice, practices of engaged Buddhism. These are 14 very interesting mindfulness practices. I, I, I already said I'm not doing a lecture or a class here and I'm not, definitely not doing a class on Thich Nhat Hanh tonight. So I'm gonna try to limit like the amount of background and historical information. But if, you, if you're not familiar though with the general chronology, you know, you should you know, be familiar that Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese Buddhist monk and that he really came to prominence during the Vietnam War for his application of his Buddhist teachings and his Buddhism, the application of Buddhism to, um, oh, I mean, nonviolent protest of the war, to all kinds of social issues that were going on in the mid to late 60s. Um, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh was right up there with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all these people that were leading the way towards a lot of things, social justice, again, the, the uh, anti-war effort, all kinds of things. And in 1966, Thich Nhat Hanh essentially formed his own school of Buddhism or tradition. It's kind of, of an offshoot of the Zen type of Buddhism that he was lineaged into and that he is a lineage teacher of. 
And so this um, order of interbeing is what he called it, the order of interbeing was um, essentially the nonprofit, seemingly the nonprofit arm of his organization. He also had a monastic, uh, both a lay and has, I should say, a lay and monastic Buddhist organization, which is the Plum Village tradition, kind of a unique uh, Thich Nhat Hanh style Buddhism. And effectively, again, without going into all of the specific details of this, these 14 mindfulness practices are the foundation of his of his teachings of his school in that way and the in 1966 a very small group of followers of Thich Nhat Hanh they took these as vows you know that I vow to practice this sort of from here on out and I wanted to basically spend this time with you tonight in going through these 14 mindfulness practices or remembrances, maybe another way to think of it. And I mean, I think if, if you're not familiar with them, I think you'll like them as much as I do and really, you know, appreciate the wisdom of them. The main thing that I, is amazing for me about Thich Nhat Hanh going back to the 60s and all of his books since then is his very uh, adept, gentle way of translating or adapting Buddhism for the modern world. And of course, that's what this series is about, is very much this idea of like, how do we use our practice? How do we use our, our dharma in that sense to, to, you know, to deal with the world that we're in? Not just in a nice, quiet space by myself, you know, but daily practice and so these 14 points that were that i want to share with you take on hans points you'll i think you'll immediately hear how they are classic dharma i mean straight out of the suttas you know just really old school but at the same time really modernized or or something it's hard to explain and because like i said at the top of this uh, this isn't going to be my normal kind of class i'm really not going to try to take us out there you know and all of that i want to keep this very kind of nice um and to the best of my ability kind of chill right um and so i thought a good way to do that and also to make sure that we give these 14 mindfulness practice their practices their their due time I thought I would be nice to start, not necessarily with a sit, although I see you know some of you are already sort of in a sitting posture. And so I wanted to spend just the beginning of this, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, however long it kind of takes, to, on my part, mindfully read each of these and allow them to really just be heard. No commentary on my part, no, you know, please, you know, just no questions or answers just yet. I'd like to just read each of these with a nice, you know, moment of reflective silence in between them. And then go through each of them so that we can really hear what Thich Nhat Hanh was saying, think about what he's asking of his practitioners. And then we'll dive into a really lovely discussion. There's a lot of beautiful folks here. And so a nice discussion of them um, and how they might be applicable to our practice and what we're, uh, what we're working with, yeah. By the way, in terms of source material here, again, Thich Nhat Hanh developed these in uh, the 60s, 1966 is usually the year that all of this is given credit for having arisen. If you're interested in this though, um, by the way, that's our Thich Nhat Hanh lovely enlightened being um this is one source of these the book called being peace uh kind of the the manual for engaged buddhism um and just uh because i i might forget to do it later engaged buddhism is this term that Thich Nhat Hanh coined to describe a socially 
engaged form of Buddhism, which was a, a Buddhism that came out of the monasteries, out of the temples, and kind of came into the streets, streets of Saigon, in order to, to, in terms of the Vietnam War, but also just the streets. And so uh, engaged Buddhism is, is Thich Nhat Hanh's idea of how to make Buddhism applicable to the problems of the modern world. So um, that's engaged Buddhism. This is kind of the manual for that. However, there is also Lion's Roar. Lion's Roar is an online magazine and a print magazine. Um, and let's see, when is this? This is April 12th, 2017. Uh, they published the 14 uh, mindfulness practices. And so um, it's a little tricky. I'm going to actually read from the book, which is the full articulation of these. Um, these, this is sort of the re, uh, redacted version. So, okay, that's the, my brief uh, preface on all of that. We'll have plenty of time to discuss later all these ideas. Um, yeah, and so really just kick back, you know. I just, you know, hope everybody can just uh, mindfully hear these. Um, yeah, and so again, I'm just going to go through them slowly. Um, Here's, here's how they go. These are uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's 14 mindfulness practices of engaged Buddhism. The first mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering created by fanaticism and intolerance. We are determined not to be idolatrous about or bound to any doctrine, any theory, or any ideology, even Buddhist ones. Buddhist teachings are guiding means to help us learn how to look deeply and to develop our understanding and our compassion. They are not doctrines to fight for, to kill for, or to die for. The second mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering created by attachment to views and to wrong perceptions, we are determined to avoid being narrow-minded and bound to our present views. We shall learn and practice non-attachment from views in order to be open to others' insights and experiences. We are aware that the knowledge we presently possess is not changeless. It is not absolute truth. Truth is found in life. And we will observe life within and around us in every moment, ready to learn throughout our lives. The third mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering brought about when we impose our views on others. We are committed not to force others, even our children, by any means whatsoever, such as authority, threat, money, propaganda, or indoctrination. Not by any means whatsoever are we to adopt our views. We are not to force others to adopt our views. We will respect the right of others to be different and to choose what to believe and how to decide. We will, however, help others renounce fanaticism and narrow-mindedness through compassionate dialogue. The fourth mindfulness training. 
aware that looking deeply at the nature of suffering can help us develop compassion and find ways out of suffering. We are determined not to avoid or close our eyes before suffering. We are committed to finding ways, including personal contact images and sounds, to be with those who suffer so we can understand their situation deeply and help them transform their suffering into compassion, peace, and joy. The fifth mindfulness training. Aware that true happiness is rooted in peace, solidity, freedom and compassion and not in wealth or fame we are determined not to take as the aim of our life fame profit wealth or sensual pleasure nor to accumulate wealth while millions are hungry and dying we are committed to living simply and sharing our time our energy and material resources with those in need. We will practice mindful consuming, not using alcohol, drugs, or any other products that bring toxins into our own and the collective body and consciousness. The sixth mindfulness training. Aware that anger blocks communication and creates suffering, we are determined to take care of the energy of anger when it arises and to recognize and transform the seeds of anger that lie deep in our consciousness. When anger comes up, we are determined not to do or say anything but to practice mindful breathing or mindful walking and acknowledge, embrace, and look deeply into our anger. We will learn to look with the eyes of compassion at those we think are the cause of our anger. The seventh mindfulness training. Aware that life is available only in the present moment and that it is possible to live happily in the here and now. We are committed to training ourselves to live deeply in each moment of our daily life. We will try not to lose ourselves in dispersion or be carried away by regrets about the past, worries about the future, or craving anger or jealousy in the present. We will practice mindful breathing to come back to what is happening in the present moment. We are determined to learn the art of mindful living by touching the wondrous, refreshing, and healing elements that are inside and all around us, and by nourishing seeds of joy, peace, love, and understanding in ourselves, thus facilitating the work of transformation and healing in our consciousness. The eighth mindfulness training. Aware that the lack of communication always brings separation and suffering, we are committed to training ourselves in the practice of compassionate listening and loving speech. We will learn to listen deeply without judgment or reacting 
and refrain from uttering words that create discord or cause our community to break. We will make every effort to keep communications open and to reconcile and resolve all conflicts, however small. The ninth mindfulness training. Aware that words can create suffering or happiness. We are committed to learning to speak truthfully and constructively, using only words that inspire hope and confidence. We are determined not to say untruthful things for the sake of personal interest or to impress people, nor to utter words that might cause division or hatred. We will not spread news that we do not know to be certain, nor criticize or condemn things of which we are not sure. We will do our best to speak out about situations of injustice even when doing so may threaten our safety. The 10th mindfulness training, aware that the essence and aim of a community is the practice and understanding, is the practice of understanding and compassion, we are determined not to use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit or transform our community into a political instrument. A spiritual community should, however, take a clear stand against oppression and injustice and should strive to change the situation without engaging in partisan conflicts. The 11th mindfulness training. Aware that great violence and injustice have been done to our environment and our society. We are committed to not live with a vocation that is harmful to humans or harmful to nature. We will do our best to select a livelihood that helps realize our ideal of understanding and compassion. Aware of global economic, political, and social realities, we will behave responsibly as consumers and as citizens, not investing in companies that deprive others of their chance to live. The 12th mindfulness training. Aware that much suffering is caused by war and conflict, we are determined to cultivate nonviolence, understanding, and compassion in our daily lives to promote peace education, mindful meditation and reconciliation within families, communities, nations, and in the world. We are determined not to kill and not to let others kill. We will diligently practice deep looking with our community to discover better ways to protect life and to prevent war. The 13th mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing and oppression, 
we are committed to cultivating loving kindness and learning ways to work for the well being of people, animals, plants, and minerals. We will practice generosity by sharing our time, our energy, and our material resources with those who are in need. We are determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should not belong to others, or that should belong to others. We will respect the property of others, but will try to prevent others from profiting from human suffering or the suffering of other beings. And the 14th mindfulness training. For lay practitioners, Aware that sexual relations motivated by craving cannot dissipate the feeling of loneliness, but will create more suffering, frustration, and isolation, we are determined not to engage in sexual relations without mutual understanding, mutual love, and a long-term commitment. In sexual relations, we must be aware of future suffering that may be caused. We, we know that to preserve the happiness of ourselves and others, we must respect the rights and commitments of ourselves and others. We will do everything in our power to protect children from sexual abuse and to protect couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. We will treat our bodies with respect and preserve our vital energies, sexual energy, our breath energy, and our spirit energy for the realization of our bodhisattva ideal. We will be fully aware of the responsibility of bringing new lives into the world and will meditate on the world into which we are bringing those new beings. And for monastic members or aspiring monastic members, the 14th mindfulness training is aware that the aspiration of a monk or a nun or a nun can only be realized when he or she wholly leaves behind the bonds of worldly love. We are committed to practicing chastity and to helping others protect themselves. We are aware that loneliness and suffering cannot be alleviated by the coming together of two bodies in a sexual relationship, but by the practice of true understanding and compassion. We know that a sexual relationship will destroy our life as a monk or a nun and will prevent us from realizing our ideal of serving all living beings. We are determined not to suppress or mistreat our body or to look upon our body as only an instrument, but to learn to handle our body with respect. We are determined to preserve our vital energies for the realization of our bodhisattva ideal. Okay, so those are the 14 mindfulness trainings. Uh, you might have noted from the last one that there are sort of kind of special versions of these for monastics and for laity. Um, and since I'm kind of assuming that everybody in the Zoom and sort of, you know, most of us are lay practitioners, we're kind of going to focus more kind of as I did in my reading, I'll fo focus more on the lay aspect of these things. Um, right away, right away, right? Let's take Thich Nhat Hanh's first mindfulness training truly to heart and let it be known, of course, that none of this is absolute truth. 
we do not bow down to Thich Nhat Hanh as the source of absolute truth. We understand that these are guidelines, right? As he said, in his own mindfulness training, these are strictly guidelines. And so, you know, obviously I want to hear from everybody. I'd like to talk about these, you know, but if anything kind of ruffled your feathers or you were feeling like, well, that's not my Buddhism or something to that effect, that's what he's, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> So, so I just want to say that off the, off the, from the get, right? I am trying to practice this, so I have no fixed attachment to these. I use these as guidelines, and so definitely let's start there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, because I don't really want this to be sort of so one way about it. Did anything pop out right away? Anything? Anybody have anything that just one way or another. Yeah, Claudia, hi. Great to see you. You too. Uh, yeah, I was wondering what kind of um, lineage or school of thought, if you want. I mean, I, I'm not as knowledgeable of the different schools of Buddhism as you are, but I guess what I'm thinking is that one of the things that I love about what I know about Buddhism is that the Buddha said, you don't have to follow me. You don't have, I mean, you don't have to believe me. Just try it. And if it works for you, fine. Right. Yet in my spiritual quest, I mean, when I was, when I was looking for a path, I did encounter just like in Catholic religions, you know, or there are different, uh, currents if you want and there was one that was uh precisely the, i mean it, it, they were violating the first principle in that they had this reverence and worshiping almost uh a couple of human beings mm. like you and i you know it was president taikeda and his wife and this was the gsi movement yep. or whatever and oh my god i ran away from that <laughs> as soon as i figure out what they were about mm -hmm. interestingly though i mean they were incredibly proselytist and they had the most diverse membership i've ever seen in mm -hmm. any of the buddhist places I've been to. The Zen Center was super white and male many, many years ago. Uh, you know, I was like, really, that impressed me. And they were organized so well, you know. But uh, again, I just, the minute they started like, Mr. Aikera, yeah. forget it, you know. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> so anyway. Just, no, no. Yeah, and of course, uh, Soka Gakkai, the SGI Soka Gakkai International, that group. Yeah, they're they're a particular type of Buddhism, particular type of Japanese Buddhism. Um, and in terms of lineages and traditions, um, yeah, uh, quite different than Thich Nhat Hanh. I mentioned at the beginning, Thich Nhat Hanh is lineage in the Zen or it's a Vietnamese Zen tradition. Um, and so he's of that school. And Zen already is, is rather a special type of Buddhism um, for, well, even in its day, meaning the sixth, seventh, eighth century, in its day, it was a very modern type of Buddhism. And by modern, I, I, I mean really adapting to culture and adapting to what was going on. And really, uh, yeah, the Zen tradition is known for almost recklessly letting go of a lot of rules and a lot of tradition in order to make itself adaptable to the modern world or whatever world it finds itself in. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise that a Vietnamese Zen monk, Thich Nhat Hanh 
would then take that even further in the face of the Vietnam War and everything going on in the 60s. And so he creates his order of interbeing, as he called it, which was even, even more kind of Zen in that way of being, you know, um, you know, really adapting and changing to the modern world. Then there's other types of Buddhism, yeah, that are much more uh, reverential in that way, a little more of uh, that, the bowing down. And to the degree to which they are heavily proselytizing and really trying to convince people of their view, I agree with you, Claudia, that it sounds like that's kind of against at least Thich Nhat Hanh's version of Buddhism or the Dharma. But I don't, I would encourage, just on this note, I would, I would encourage you to apply Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching. And what I mean by that is, is that just because that's not your cup of tea, right? Now, if they were like, get over here, you're, you're going to hell until you get down on your knees, then maybe they've crossed that line, right? But otherwise, I think the beautiful thing about Buddhism is that there's so many different ways and types of styles of doing it that, you know, some people are into submission. I don't mean that in a kinky sexual way. I mean it in they're in, they're into that, you know, and it, it's like, so I, again, I just say, let's, <laughs> let's think of Han's rule or his uh, mindfulness training. Any other uh, things pop up, questions, comments, ideas? Um, hey, Michael. Hey. Oh, there's an echo. Um, first of all, I loved um, the experience of sort of being read too. It reminded me of, um, yeah, being a child. And I would love to um, read to more folks and be read to more folks in my life. Um, and one of the... Um, one of them really struck me, and I'd love to go back to it, which was talking about the um, sort of the, the ingesting poisons and substances, I, and there was the, um, this collective body. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts on that is. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me locate that one specifically, because I wanted to share with you something. Yep, so that's the fifth one, I think. So yeah, that's the fifth mindfulness training, which actually the reason why if you, and it's online, if you look up the, the Lion's Roar article that has the 14 listed, they're listed in this much more bulleted, like bullet points. And so what's, what's helpful is to notice that the fifth one is the, about not accumulating wealth while other people are starving. And that ultimately it's about living simply and not seeking fame and profit. That's, that's actually the message of that one. But in this, in the book, in the, when he elaborates more, he does say that we are committed to living simply and sharing our time and our resources, that we will practice mindful consuming, not using alcohol, drugs, or any other products that bring toxins into our own, and the collective body and our own consciousness and the collective consciousness actually so i did i did want to make a note about that um you know with all 14 of these again they have like their main point and again the main point of that one is sort of about living simply and not seeking fame and he kind of throws in the intoxicants in there and it's it's kind of one of those things that i think is helpful about that that particular rule and if you're familiar with the precepts the either the five precepts the eight precepts the ten precepts or how if you're familiar with buddhist precepts you probably heard many of them ideas of right livelihood right speech right action, not killing. You, you heard all the precepts, right? But he, Thich Nhat Hanh worded all of these, you know, in a, such a beautiful way where it's like, you know, not just for its own sake or whatever, 
But it's like, because we know this causes suffering and because of this, that's why we should avoid it. And so on the note of the intoxicants, you know, there's a lot of uh, commentary that's been made about this particular precept. What did the Buddha say exactly? What did he mean? Um, it's debated. There definitely seems to be a sense in which what he was talking about, in many ways, the word intoxicants is 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 to the point because he was worried about like the Buddha, not taking on home, the Buddha seems to be worried about substances that dull the mind. And so usually there's a real emphasis on alcohol as like the culprit, as a dulling, it has a dulling effect. And that's where you can get this whole Zen tea tradition, where they're really into tea. And it's kind of like, well, isn't tea a kind of a, you know, basically a stimulant? And it's kind of like, yeah, but if you read the rule, the Buddha really wasn't like, you know, the, definitely the Buddha was smart enough to know that we're, we're messing with our body chemistry with every single thing we ingest every substance that we put into our body affects our consciousness and our physical body. The Buddha knew that. And so I think when you read the rule, it's sort of about ingesting things that are stupefying, dulling of consciousness. Or if you want to, you know, I would want to be a modern Thich Nhat Hanh revisionist. And I would want to throw like, you know, fast food into this category. Like, you know, before I threw other, um, you know, herbs or other things into this category, I would throw, you know, I would throw the fast food in the category. So this is definitely a situation where, you know, we, we, these are guidelines, like he said, in that way. And ultimately, to answer, Eli, to answer your question more directly, what I think he meant by the collective body and collective consciousness versus one's own body and consciousness. I think he's a, you know, a serious Buddhist and he understands the deep interdependent relationship of reality and understands that, oh, I don't know, if I'm like all drunk and belligerent and then I go down to the local store and I'm just all like infecting uh, collective space, the collective body with my drunken belligerence, I'm kind of intoxicating or messing up the collective body as well as my own, the collective conscious as well as my own. So. And of course, just on that note too, that, you know, usually the, the avoiding intoxication if that goes for Buddhist writ large, not just for the monks, it's kind of like writ large. But again, there's a lot of lot of interpretation of that particular. One. Yeah, Tanya. Um, so can I? Is it okay if we trans? Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I was really struck by the first three. Me too. Um, and I'm just <laughs> pulling them up, especially given. Um, all the stuff that's going on right now and you know i'm finding i i really need to modulate more how much news i'm reading because as we get closer and closer to the election things seem to be getting crazier and crazier yeah. as you know certain people get more apparently desperate <laughs> but um so you know just that rem it was just really you know so i'm looking at them right now like you know, don't get so, you know, don't get idolatrous even about Buddhism. Um, you know, know that there's no absolute truth. And then like, don't force others to try to believe what you believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with all this like kind of friction and conflict that's going on right now, I think that's a really good thing to remember, though it's nice that it <laughs> that says like, you know, but then remind, you know, both us, you know, and them not to be fanatics, right? And just basically just all settle down a little bit, right? You know, and then it also struck me too about, especially the third one about where it talks about children as well. Um, I'm really close with my nephew and, you know, 
you know, I don't have any kids, but I'm super close with him. So he's kind of like, you know, he's not my kid, but he sort of is, right? His parents call me the third parent. But anyway, I mean, and, uh, you know, just in making, allowing him to have his own views and develop his own, um, um, yeah, and, you know, give him his space and stuff. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it was all really great, but I was particularly, like, especially when you started reading that first one, I was like, oh, you know? <laughs> with what's going on right now so yeah so thank you. I had yeah thank you Tanya I had the same reaction and I know you know I know this series started you know many many months ago when we were sort of faced with this kind of the reckoning and and sort of this social uh, deep social justice situation and as I was getting ready for this class I kind of realized wow you know we have this new you know not that it's new politics is as old as it gets in that way but you know, we are, you know, the, all these things keep changing. And so I did think when I was reading these, oh, I, I would really like to focus on those. The, the emphasis that three of the, the top three, they have on this idea of views, ideologies. And yeah, Tanya, I had that initial reaction of like, oh, wow, this, we need to hear this. And not just that we need to hear it, but we need to think about, we need to think about this. So yeah, just really quickly, and I'll read the uh, I'll read the truncated ones really quickly from here because they're you know again they're much shorter. But let's just say about the first one: so not be idolatrous about or bound to any doctrine, theory, or ideology, even Buddhist ones. Buddhist systems of thought are guiding means; they're not absolute truth. So. I mean, this is, of course, for a lot of folks that I recognize in the room, this is like, yeah, that's Dharma. That's the practice. That's the, that's the practice, is recognizing how conditioned and narrow even our thinking is. Forget the idiots. Forget the, the people out there and their ideas and that. This is about uh, you, me, and this kind of recognition that well, again, you know, if we want to talk about the deeper Dharma that we're usually talking about, you know, this is, this is the, the idea that we have very fixed views and not just political, religious, or otherwise, we have fixed views about everything. And they get us into trouble more times than not. According to the Buddha, they get us into trouble all the time. And so, this, this particular idea about views or ideologies, it cuts two ways. And the way that it cuts two ways is uh, check, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And then the other way is not to be so judgmental about other people's views. Because we are usually judging those views based on our rigid attachment to our views. And so what this first one, not being idolatrous or bound to any doctrine, even Buddhist ones, is about like being open-minded, big time, big time. Open. And, and these are mindfulness training practices. The, the Buddha <laughs> recognizes that this doesn't come easy to us, <laughs> that we have to be trained to not rigidly attached to our view and judge others <laughs> right can, can i jump in yeah, please, please, please. saying what you were just saying to it it, it it helps us be like just calm down and be more open so that we can really listen actively and then maybe communicate even with someone who may be completely up on the opposite spectrum of what our beliefs are um it does and, and doing so doesn't mean that one agrees with what they're ideas are oh. but but it just it doesn't inflame the situation and maybe hopefully would in some instances allow from some dialogue so that so that the people aren't pinging off of each other emotionally right you know reactively exactly but, so. exactly and and again upon further investigation if you really think about this it does become a thing of like you know two 
rigidly attached to their ideology people <laughs> there's no there's no things ever going to happen <laughs> it's, just, that's just, it's just not going to happen there's going to be no communication there will only be division in that way and so yeah and so i have more to say about that but let's any questions or other comments We're, i'm going to stick on this uh, idea of views by the way but, honey you got something Yes, um, so uh, when I read these 14 um, points, they sound, you know, like I'm not saying basic, but, you know, I could think I could read that in Christianity, for example. The only, th or like similar, the only thing that obviously stood, um, stands out to me and which is like, is touching the core teaching of Buddhism is when he talks about suffering. So when he incorporates the Four Noble Truths. And I think, um, this is, uh, for me, this is stands out the most because if we understand and really practice number four, um, so if we really understand um, the root of suffering, everything else becomes obviously clear and um, um, shines light on everything. So for me, obviously, the, the number four was the most significant also in the context of Buddha Dharma, so to speak. Absolutely, Connie. And not to not to try to wrestle the conversation back to the views thing, but I would say, yeah, a lot of these are about like, do good, don't do evil type of stuff. And yeah, that sort of could be just as easily Christian or what have you. I personally would would say that that these the this emphasis on not being attached to a view or an ideology. I don't, the reason why I'm Buddhist is because that's what they're teaching. <laughs> and the reason why I'm not Christian is because they're actually teaching an ideology. And actually, what actually, if you get down to it, what makes you a Christian is the adoption of that ideology, meaning that you have, been, have accepted Jesus as your savior. And that's the ideology. And if you don't believe that ideology, you're not in the club. This is not a knock on that at all. Please do not take this as a knock. I'm just saying that this Buddhism is a unique, very special, unique tradition, even philosophy, because even the philosophers aren't ready to let go of their philosophy in that way. So I just would like to spend just a few more minutes to go through number two and three, and then we'll get to Connie's, the not turning away from suffering, which is, yes, huge, huge. But if Michael, I may, Michael, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I would really, really, really like for you to address if I don't know, if we'll have the time, but I think it, this is really, to me, kind of like the core of one of the reasons why we're here is number nine and number 10, because it talks about speak truthfully, speak up to injustice, I think. And so was mm -hmm. number 10, spiritual community will, will take a stand in injustice. It's not partis partisanship, but something about taking a stand of in, on injustice. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. So just to finish up about the views, I really just wanted to like, I guess I, I would just, let me just finish the views one with this beautiful line that he has at the end of number two, which is about be ready to learn throughout your entire life and to observe reality in yourself and in the world at all times. That, that's for me, you know, a sentiment that, that re rings really true of being a learner your whole life. And the ideology game is thinking you've got it all figured out. Like, oh yeah, I got this. This is, this is, you know, reality is X. And now if I just, you know, figure out the rest, I'm good or whatever. So that, that idea that, that you've got it all figured out and you, you, you're good, you know exactly what's going on here. I think, well, you know, because I'm going to get to number four, the suffering in that sense, the Dharma here actually is, is that narrow-minded, strict views are actually causing us to suffer. 
they're actually causing us suffering. And one, I think it behooves us, or I would suggest that it would, one does well to reflect on the idea of what, what would be lost if I wasn't holding on so hard to this ideology? What would really be the loss? Right, or, oh, this person that doesn't get it, this person that doesn't understand, right? If only I could get them to believe me, right? I think it's worth investigating what our intentions are regarding holding on to an ideology. Are you trying to be right? Would you like to be right? Do you, you know, these things. And so where I'm going with that is, is, is definitely try, definitely avoid being like, wow, well, you're really attached to your view. I'm not attached to my view. And guess what, buddy? You, you just got really deeply attached to a view if you're judging somebody as being overly attached to their view. That's part of it. This is. So I just wanted to add that, that this is a very deep practice and that it's not just about politics and religion. It's like we're really deep. We're very, very narrow, more mer narrow minded than we think or know. And so to just take that step back, it, it's really helpful. Robert, do you have a comment or are you doing more sign language? No, I, uh, I wanted to um, note that uh, in 1966 in Vietnam, there, you were either communist or I guess capitalist or free as it were, and they killed each other just suspecting that one was from the other camp. So uh, to, to let go of your, your view would be a huge deal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also, I mean, just because I do want to move on, one last thing about the, about the views, having rigid attachment to ideologies or views, how can I, how can I put this nicely? It's how you get trolled. And so if you want to avoid getting trolled by this crazy world we live in, that's pushing all of your buttons and being like, ha ha, ha ha, a good way to avoid that is to not have such rigid attachment to those views. It actually, it's a superpower in this world we live in to, be kind of impervious to the comments section. So, shall we say? Okay. Number four, Connie mentioned it to not turn away from suffering. Huge, huge. It's a big problem in our world. Uh, you know, and of course, I would suggest that in this modern world, um, one of the easiest ways to turn away from suffering might be to make a donation. And what I mean by that is, here you go, I'm good, bye. I don't need to worry about your problem anymore. I'm one of the good people that donated. So I can go around being like, I donated to the cause that you donate. And that is not encountering the suffering. Now, I'm not saying that Supporting causes and all that is, is de facto a problem. But I'm saying that when Thich Nhat Hanh talks about not avoiding suffering, it, it, he kind of means it. He means like confronting it. And there are various ways that we avoid it. And I just threw that one out there as a, as a, a critical way of looking at it. Like, oh, that actually, huh. I could see where maybe people do that. I do that in various ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, number five we did, that was the one about trying to live simply and not accumulate wealth with a little bit of intoxication thrown in at the end, right? Number six, about avoiding anger, not holding on to anger, right? That's pretty classic Buddhist in that way. Anger is one of the kleshas, one of the defilements. And, you know, the language of trying not to allow anger to arise, and if it does arise, kind of trying to keep it in check, that's classic right effort. Yeah, Ray. 
I was reading a, a really good book uh, by Lama Rod Owens about uh, love and rage. And he really touches, of course, on the rage, right, and the anger. And what I really liked um, more so with his approach was uh, learning to make space and room for the anger and not push it away, but embrace it mm -hmm. and really fall in love with your anger. And that releases you from the same. So I felt that was a really good uh, yeah. teaching on that. Yeah, and and you know, Thich Nhat Hanh uh, did ha does have where he says, um, yeah, about this idea that when anger comes up, uh, we are determined not to do or say anything. Interesting, but to practice mindful breathing or mindful walking and acknowledge, embrace, and look deeply into our anger. So I I too have have a, a read. Lamarad, and I know where he's coming from, and that's kind of, you know, he's a tantrist. He's a in the in the, the Tibetan tradition, and so they are even more into embracing the anger and the rage and and confronting it in that way. Thich Nhat Hanh's a little more middle path, middle roady there, where it is sort of this idea of not turning away from the anger, embracing it, and looking deeply into it. Um, but yeah, not with quite such a tantric um, uh, where anger is your bedfellow in that in that way. But, um, good insight. I think it's really interesting. Number eight to build on the anger is that other words that create discord, make every effort to reconcile and resolve all conflicts, however small. That's I think a that's big one. Really nice one. It's tough. It is. Language is, is powerful. So powerful. He has somewhere, I'm not sure if it's in here, I've been reading so much Thich Nhat Hanh lately, but he has this thing about how, you know, with your words, you can make or break somebody's day. Mm -hmm. you, you could devastate somebody in the morning with, you know, or you could set them off on their best day. And it's, that speaks to the power of language for sure. And so I think the note about large or small, like we got to check even the smallest little bit of it. Definitely. I did want to take a step back to the related one, which was number seven, which it was interesting. This idea, it's a really interesting one. Um, as in, you know, the rest of these are like, don't kill and try to tell the truth. And, you know, and it's like, okay, okay, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on that. Okay. And then number seven, aware that life is available only in the present moment and that it is possible to live happily in the here and now, we are committed to training ourselves to live deeply in each moment. Wow, like talk about a precept. I vow, I vow to try to live presently in each moment. I do, I do, I do, but it's like, yeah, that's a powerful precept. Michael? Yeah. That, that that one kind of reminds me of something that one of the themes that's come up in the wise action class is or may, maybe not just in this class but lately is this idea that you know we and it's related to like uh <laughs> guilt and ver it, like the example you gave of like okay here i donated the money i'm done i've done my part right um I've just heard from a lot of teachers recently this idea that we, at, at times like this, and by times like this, I mean, you know, September 15th, 2020, and everything that's going on, we sometimes feel guilty if we're not suffering. Like, oh, mm -hmm. I should be feeling bad. I should be angry, or I should be unhappy. Or I, and, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh talks so much about 
that we have a choice in any moment, whether to touch the suffering or to touch the freedom, to touch the, the, that, that it's always there and available to us. And I think it relates to this, the theme of this class in that sense that I, I know I've experienced, you know, uh, you know, someone calls me on the phone and says, how are you? And I say, I'm doing great. And then I realize, oh, I'm supposed to be like, oh, it's, you know, it's smoky and there's unrest and there's a virus and I'm supposed to be suffering, you know, and so I don't know what you yeah. call it. I, I hear I hear you know I hear you especially the, the what you're actually really talking about today September 15th 2020 I hear you loud and clear and you know I'd like to talk about this but my feeling from some of the things we've already talked about and some of the uh, practices we haven't gotten to yet there's almost a way for Thich Nhat Han if I'm if I'm understanding and reading him correctly that there's kind of almost a moral obligation to be happy. But what I mean by that is, is that if we're all meh, meh, and then we're just spreading that everywhere because of the interconnectedness of the body, conscious body and physical body of all of us, right? We almost have a moral obligation to be happy. Now, not in any kind of ignorant way where we don't know that all this craziness is happening we're like what do you mean like it's sunny up here you know or whatever like so not like that but we do from a Thich Nhat Hanh point of view again as far as I understand him have this kind of moral obligation to truly be of course compassionate and kind but even to kind of be happy interesting right totally All right, uh, and you mentioned about not sowing, using language that sows discord, definitely, especially in terms of maintaining cohesion in a community, right? And then number nine is about the dangers of untruthfulness, the dangers of lying. And also, by the way, this great, like also very kind of practical for our modern world, do not spread news that you do not know to be certain. Hello? That's like, what's going on nowadays <laughs> is the spreading of a bunch of news nobody is sure is certain. That's all we do all the time, right? So <laughs> that's an interesting mindfulness training, right? not to use our community or our Buddhist community for personal gain or as a political party. That's an interesting application of all the first rules regarding ideology, but to the group, right? That the, the, the Sangha or the community shouldn't be ideological in that sense, should be practicing what they're preaching in that sense. Yeah. Number 11 was about our right livelihood, right? And that's kind of a classic um, aspect of Buddhism is it's part of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is like that our daily occupation, in particular, the way that we support ourselves, be, be in line with the precepts. So, so as basically not having an occupation that requires you to harm didn't we, it was this the one that had the minerals where we were supposed to even be watching out for the minerals too? That, that, I was like, wow, the minerals. Yeah, well, one of these, we, we were supposed to be mindful of the people, the plants, the animals, and the minerals, right? Number 12 was the classic, no killing, right? Also on the on the language one, did you notice his lovely use of do our best to X, Y, or Z? Not thou shalt not or thou is going to hell. Not, you know, this, it's like do the best. <laughs> do the best you can. <laughs> so on that. 
find whatever means possible to protect life and to prevent war or conflict. Number 13, possess nothing that should, not be that should belong to others and respect the property of others. This is basically the no stealing precept in the form of a mindfulness practice, right? Traditionally, of course, this is the practice of not taking anything that hasn't been given. Like, that's how, that's how you know whether you took it or not. <laughs> like, was it given? <laughs> well, the, did you pay for it? You know, because if you pay for it, they put it in a nice little bag, and that's a form of giving it to you. So you're, you're okay there. Uh, but if they're like, well, nobody's looking, whoop. <laughs> and now we can spend the rest of our time <laughs> discussing the tricky, delicate subject of sexuality. <laughs> so the number 14, which by the way, I also love, I really appreciate that he, that the, the actual precept, the mindfulness training of number 14, do not mistreat your body period that's the that's the that and then we get into like sexuality sexual uh, preserving your vital sexual energy and all these other things but i like to peel it all the way back to his initial point which was not to mistreat your body right Again, this of course is sort of a, a tricky, it's a really tricky Buddhist topic because, you know, uh, most of you who have, who have been in my classes, you know that I teach Buddhism a little more historically in that way. So I'm always referring to the early days of Buddhism, those first few hundred years that we kind of know a little bit about. And it's for me as a teacher, it's important to remember that Buddhism started as a deeply renunciatory path. And by renunciation, we're not just talking about renouncing sexuality or renouncing our hair or renouncing our family or renouncing our house or our job or our money. And our, it's actually this grand, the, the, the original program of Buddhism was the grand renunciation of the, this world and everything in it. To develop, in the language of the early Pali suttas, to develop dispassion or disinterest in this world, to not be delighted by the things of this world, and, you know, just to cut to it, to ultimately be delighted and joyful by deep states of meditation and by liberation and non-suffering. That's what should be producing joy and all of that. Everything in this world is sort of just gonna let you down or be a source of suffering. So the original, original first few hundred year prescription was don't have sex. Don't even touch another human being, actually. Ren you renounced it all. Now, of course, we know that Buddhism it has a large lay practice and very early on developed a form of lay Buddhism. And even in those next few hundred years, all of that lay Buddhist practice was kind of just so to get you ready to do the real practice, which is renounce and be a monk or a nun. But that's, you know, by the time we move into, like, you know, the, what's called the common era, the last 2,000 years of Buddhist history, it, you know, it's gotten much more complicated as it pertains to marriage, uh, child, having kids, and all of that. And Buddhist organizations and Buddhist communities have had to deal with and wrestle with sexuality. And it's tricky because they're 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 dealing with a foundation where it was very clear 
how to deal with sexuality. So, so clear. Stay away. Just stay away. So when Buddhism moves into the common era, the last 2,000 years, and either we're talking about a lay Buddhist practice where people will have sexual relations, or we're even talking about a Vajrayana esoteric type of Buddhism that allows for sexuality, uses sexuality. So within all of that, whether we're talking about a, a lay Buddhism or Vajrayana, the Buddhist traditions have, have are, they've been faced with a conundrum which is like, how do we talk about this sexuality? How do we deal with this stuff? And for the most part, all the different Buddhist organizations and communities and sanghas sort of split off. They split off for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is this sexuality question. How, how, what do you do with this? For, I think, you know, for... For Thich Nhat Hanh, it sounds like, certainly for me as a Buddhist teacher, the, the, the important message would be about uh, non-harm. Go back to the violence, harm thing, not just physically, emotionally, psychologically, of course, all of that. And that the real you know, the real important thing is about violence and harm and recognizing that, that, you know, that sexuality is a very powerful thing. And, and, and so it needs to be respected. It's what he says. Well, he says, learn to handle your body with respect. But it's also, I think, if, if I may paraphrase Thich Nhat Hanh, that it's like, okay, hey, people, we're going to have sexuality. Okay, be careful. And I don't mean wear a condom. I mean, be careful. Be full of care. Right? I, I, have, also said, I have also said in the past when it comes to this, that you could, you could also put sexuality in, in the same camp as stealing, which is in the same way you shouldn't take something that hasn't been given you should, of course, never take sexuality that hasn't been given. That's a great rule of thumb where you can apply Buddhist teachings to sexuality by saying, oh, I never take it when, unless it's been given. The inter and we're talking about the mutual understanding, mutual respect that Thich Nhat Hanh talked about, right? Comments, answers, ideas. Yeah, Ray. Yeah, um, in some of my early readings um, of Buddhist, uh, some of the books that I've read, I, that's one thing that kind of really, uh, the, the whole abstaining from sexual relations, because um, to me, anytime you, you're repressing, a natural uh, body, or what would you say, a natural human mm -hmm. uh, response is usually drives more of what you don't want, right? Because <laughs> I mean, if you look at <laughs> push yeah. this down, that goes up, <laughs> yeah. right? And you look at the Catholic Church and a lot of the problems they've had um, with child molestation and stuff, it makes you kind of put that together. It's like, wait, you're making them go into vows of no sex, and then some reaction comes out of that. Does that make yeah. any sense? <laughs> it makes total sense. It makes total sense. And, you know, you know, typically the laity, in most traditions I know of, the laity are not encouraged to abstain. They're encouraged to respect. But like I said, Buddhism is traditionally a, a tradition of abstinence in that way, because it's traditionally a monastic uh, tradition. But I would like to you know, point out to you that most Buddhist communities, the, the monastic ones, most Buddhist communities, and definitely the rules 
from way back in the day is that there was this kind of probationary period of the shramana, the, the novice monk. And it would last a few years. And basically, you tried it out. You tried out abstaining. You tried out not taking intoxicants. You tried out this. And basically, it's like, if, it, if, if, if the robes fit, so to speak, then you take the full bhikshu or bhikshuni ordination. And it's at that point that basically, if you have sex or take intoxicants, it's kind of like a, a big no-no. But a, it's a big no-no though, because you had the time to figure this out and you decided to go all the way with this. And so just to link this back to Ray's comment about Catholicism or other churches that have a problem with abstinence and sexuality, you know, Buddhism is very, you know, we, we, we've we saw it in the, these uh, mindfulness trainings, do your best. It's not a thou shalt not type of a situation. Buddhism totally recognizes what Ray's talking about in terms of that these are very kind of natural things. Um, the Buddhism I teach and the Buddhism I study in that way, there's nothing, you know, nasty or bad or immoral about sexuality. It's just the greatest distraction Mara ever came up with. <laughs> that, that's it. That's the only thing about it. It's just the greatest distraction from your practice. And so what I'm getting at is that in most of the Buddhist communities I've been in, and I've been in a few where this has happened, where the monk got caught sneaking off, off of the monastery grounds and was having an affair and got caught. It wasn't that he, that the monk was immoral, some like, it was like he just, he let his practice down. <laughs> that, that, like that, you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so there's a certain, like, for me, a very healthy attitude about sexuality in Buddhism. Now, not all traditions, uh, Claudia was mentioning the more, the types of Buddhism that look a little more Christian in that way, those tend to get a little more, uh, you know, that kind of tiss tiss type of uh, religious activity. But when you're, if you're moving in Zen circles, certainly Tibetan circles and all of that, it tends to be a, a little less uh, uh, that judgmental moralizing. And it really understands and just respects um, well, basically, in the end, Buddhism has always really respected sexual energy. Just really, truly respected it, respected how powerful it is, everything about it. So, Yeah, I think the number, number, the last, yeah, number 14, I think it's beautiful that it's generally positively phrased. It's not so much about don't, but like, you know, body and mind are connected or are one, right? Um, so it's not like don't do this and, you know, you create suffering. I think in general, I wish, you know, like these texts would be, you could phrase the whole thing and have the same um, meaning with a very positive attitude. For example, you could be like, use your sexual energy for the best of you know your development and growth and of your partner and you see each other as a mirror and you know like whatever you want to come up with right but i sometimes i mean again it's it's pretty positive i wish you could you could flip it around completely you know and um yeah i i wish it would be a little bit more um, you know what like the tantric tradition does right really using the sexual energies and I think Ray what you said before just one comment that I have is um, when you said um, the natural you know the natural um, and not energies but what did you say Ray the natural um, what humanness so to speak right like if we so suppress it then you know it, it might turn into something negative the thing is like as you said michael like it's everything is conditioned you know it's we are in deep confusion so if i let out anger 
you know, like this is not necessarily positive because I'm deeply confused, right? So only letting out sexual desire is um, mm. it's not a state of I'm human and that's what I'm meant to be. No, <laughs> you know? it's a lot of confusion. So anyway, I am touching base on two uh, aspects of number 14, but that's what, that's what came up for me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Connie. And also, yeah, thank you on, for the comment about he, the, the way he uses language. It's why I really like these 14 uh, mindfulness practices, because like I pointed out, it's classic Buddhism. It's, I mean, this is Vinaya, Vinaya stuff, old stuff, but he's really extracted the essence of the discipline, meaning the Shila, the training. He's really extracted the essence of it and used such skillful language in, you know, I pointed out a few of the places though, where, you know, making this so modern and applicable to our either lay lives or monastic lives. I didn't really mention that. It's kind of amazing that these are the, the precepts for both laity and monastics and it's only the last one about sexuality where the monastics take that sort of further step of, of making a total vow of abstinence but the other 13 are the plum village tradition Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition those are the precepts so oh um yeah I just saw that oh I did mention about number 10 which was sort of applying all of the the guidelines regarding views or ideologies number 10 was sort of about not us as individuals but as a community not turning our sangha into a political agent because that would make our sangha or our community have an ideology and that's what we're all all individually trying to avoid and so to have our community turn into an ideology. That's sort of what number 10 is about. And, yeah. Yeah. But he says we should nonetheless take a clear stand against oppression and injustice, we should yeah. strive to change the situation without taking sides in a conflict. So how do you do that? Oh, but that's the, that's, that's, it, that's, that's it, right. How do you do that? How do you do that? Yes that 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 that's what we should do that's interesting right so it's two different things that, that that that's the move that that's the middle path move yeah how how do you be the great diplomat how do you be the great diplomat that doesn't shake sides because you're trying to be a good buddhist and not have a strict view of an ideology so how do you be the peacemaker? Upaya, skillful means, wisdom. It is in the moment. You've got to be with the reality that is in the moment and then use all the other rules. I think that it really builds upon itself quite nicely. <laughs> I agree, Tania. Wow, I agree. Absolutely. Well, I'm thinking that about... You know, for example, like uh, Black Lives Matter and the white supremacists, those are okay. radical, right? They're but I mean, ideologies for sure. Right. But if there was some way of like having a dialogue so that you could find, like you could make both sides realize the shared humanity, the, 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 human aspirations that we all have and really if we could achieve like trying to get them to empathize and have compassion i mean but it's so hard both though right i think i i you know i, I wasn't going to bring up or i was going to try to avoid bringing up any specific <laughs> ideologies but it's been mentioned but i think it's a great example which is i am sure the most ardent BLM supporter wants all the right-winger people to come over and see the light. 
and I'm sure the most hardline right winger, whatever, wants all the the BLM people to wake up and and realize what's going on here or something. Now, you can take a step back and look at that and be like, wow, well, that's never going to work out. This camp is never going to be able to convince that camp. And this camp is never going to be able to convince this camp. It's just how ideologies work in that way. But what if they both relaxed their views and through some bodhisattva peacemaker and Thich Nhat Hanh in the middle actually were able, that both ideological parties were able to be like, oh, well, well we kind of want that too. Well, me too. Well, let's go for that. Oh, oh, oh. And came to an agreement. And they both abandoned their ideologies. <sighs> Could you imagine? I, I mean, can. <laughs> there, there have been great uh, negotiators that have facilitated dialogues. I mean, like, for example, in South Africa, when there was apartheid, you know, I can't remember the name of the guy, but there's, there's some, but some people who are pretty good at that, and they were able to you know, they managed to get both sides to have a dialogue. I yeah. Mean, it's I'm not impossible, it's, but it's very hard. I was about to say, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think there is a way that it, you know, with Thich Nhat Hanh's suggestion, we take a step back, and again, with, the eye, with an eye of wisdom, we ask ourselves, like, what's the move? trying to get all of these people to believe this or trying to get all these people to believe that or is the move both people relaxing and coming to some common ground i think take down han saying that that's the move but how do you do, how do you do all this while also taking a very clear stand against oppression and injustice he's it's all and, through here of course that we do not turn away from suffering we do not turn away from injustice yeah. and all of that but taking a stand means saying that this is not okay. On, so on that note, and I, it's getting a little late, so I want to try to wind this down. But I've said this before uh, regarding like the precept against killing. There's no middle road when it comes to that. That's, there's no middle road. There's not an acceptable amount of it. It's like, no, period. And I would suggest, and this, this could get philosophical and argumentative really quickly, <laughs> but I would suggest that avoiding doing one's best to avoid killing is not necessarily an ideology. And this is, and this is what I mean by that. So vegans, of which I was one for a very long time, vegans are very much against killing. Certainly killing animals. They're, they're making it their whole dietary principle to avoid killing, right? But being vegan is an ideology. It's a very strong ideology. In fact, it's an ideology I had for a very long time. Here's my example of how it is, Tanya, how it is that we could deal with the social injustice and all of that without an ideology. And what I mean is, is that if we've made some sort of vow or commitment to avoiding harm and avoiding killing, then with every single thing I'm putting in my mouth, I could ask myself, was this killed? Was, was this obtained through violence? Okay, good. And I can eat it. And I could do that because I've made a vow to avoid violence. And so I could do that with every mindful bite and not have a vegan ideology or any other ideology. Okay. Because an ideology, and this, now this is turning into my classic Dharma talk, right? But an ideology is a, is a sense of self. It, it, the sense of self and an ideology are like, because I'm a vegan, I'm not a vegan anymore, right? 
But the idea that you are a Republican, or I am a vegan, or I am this, or I am that, that's an ideology, that's problematic. But to be a person who mindfully eats, <laughs> and to be a person who has made a vow to avoid violence, and who mindfully considers everything they're eating, that's, that's not about self or ideology. That's about a vow or a commitment in that sense. And if so, we already, if we've yes. already made the commitment to resolve all conflicts, however small, by the time we get to taking a strong stop against oppression, we're already good because we already said that we were going to resolve all our conflicts way back in the, in the like six or seven. Man, Bodhi, Bodhisattva Tania, always bringing it. <laughs> yeah, I, say, I mean, it, it, in, in the moment when you see oppression, you can take a stand against it. I, th I think the word take a stand does sound like a little like, you know, because there's like a self there, right? But you can certainly call it out, you know, when you see it. And you can do that every time you see it without being ideological about it, without being, I am in the anti-oppression camp, you know? Yep. I would, I would actually try to match uh, Bodhisattva Tania and say that this goes back, yeah, to that idea of trying to be present in every moment. And ideologies have actually a lot to do with a bunch of other stuff that is not present, right? All right, folks, we're past time. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta call it. Can't it. Never end. I, 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 I would love the marathon session. We've, just, we've relaxed our views of what time this class ends. Okay. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. It's really like, it's like really just refreshing, frankly. <laughs> like, oh. Thank you so much. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. So this is the last, the last one of this class. And so I, I know we're over, but I don't want to let this moment pass without just expressing joy and gratitude for everyone who's come to whether whether this is your first time uh, coming to this class or you came to all 10 uh, or somewhere in the middle path um, thank you for co-creating this with us this was one of those things where the idea took on a life of its own it was like many different people had the idea to do it at the same time and then it was this frictionless experience bringing it into being so it was really something that wanted to happen and thank you all for being here and being part of it. And if you missed any, um, Noam will put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Yes, it will. <laughs> oh, just, just and talking, Katie. for now, uh, um, I think all 10, with the exception of this one, which will be up uh, sometime soon, are up on our YouTube channel. So if you happen to miss one, uh, according to what we were talking about tonight in particular, like Issa Gucciardi a couple of weeks ago told this amazing story where she was on retreat and one of the retreatants had her purse in the retreat hall. The dog got into the retreat hall and peed into this woman's purse. And um, the, the woman sort of like assessed the situation and then ran it through the Buddhism filter. And she was like, oh, it's okay. It was just in permanent things anyway. Um, so I'm not angry, I just know it was impermanent. And Isa was there, it was like, no, someone is responsible for this. <laughs> 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 so I was thinking about that tonight. If you, if you missed that one, it's good and it's up on the YouTube channel. So check that out and check out any other ones you missed. And you know, if this, is, if this has been your Dharma door into the collective, come back, come to something else. Um, actually, I recognize literally all of you from other things, so. I'm glad we're all here together, and I'm but, glad we'll get to keep sitting together. But yeah, possibly, no. but possibly this is your door into the Dharma doors. Maybe you haven't been coming to Michael's class. So Michael uh, shares so. his wisdom with us every Sunday at 7 p.m. So if you haven't been there, you're always welcome. It's a Dharma that is true. Class. If you're not coming to Dharma doors, you are you're missing out big time. <laughs> <laughs>